Glad you guys could come back this week. Uncle Blake's message is about what a sin is, what is love, and how to be saved. I hope you're removed just like I was. And as you're, you, you have to be very careful with, uh, Brandon, when you go to Google and you go to videos, zinc, firework. Go to, go to Google, Google videos? Google. That's not Google. <laughs> this, is, this has got to do with Brandon's uh, message last week. The depth of the Bible and how there's no way that it should make sense. You know, if you're here last week, Brain talks about uh, uh, Brain talked about uh, isotropic and non-isotropic stones, and in heaven, how the, the those twelve tribes of Israel, those stones. This is something a little bit similar. This is super nerdy, and as you guys can, and me and Hugh can appreciate, nerdy things are fun. Okay, super nerdy. The University or Northwestern University. If you click on, let's do the first one. So this is this is underneath of a microscope. Okay, click on the first one, right? Um, go up and you then gotta, scroll, you gotta move scroll, the, scroll, scroll. Move that. You can't see it. This is super heavy, Mom. You gotta no, it's slide not. it. <coughs> Are you like this? <laughs> now it's in their way. Can everybody see it? No. Yes. See my way. Pull it towards you, lady. Pull it towards you. Pull it towards you. It's gonna scratch the stuff. No, no it's, it's got, got the felt on the bottom. Can everybody see now? Yeah. Start the video. Right John, what? John 8, verse 12. John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Quick hit play. This is what happens when a sperm me today. Okay? So this is the, the nerdy stuff. Northwestern University, they figured out when a sperm hits an egg, it releases guess what? Light. 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 Zinc, it's called the zinc firework. And so when mammals, when a sperm meets an egg, it releases a flash of light as soon as conception happens. Wow is right. Go over here. So that was, it was, they put it under fluorescence and you just scroll over, keep going over. If it's going to bear life, okay, what will happen was, keep going over, scroll over, scroll over, scroll over. Here it comes. So they, they lined up, I think there's, yeah, there's, there's eight of them. This is the actual, I'll get out of the way. The actual fertilization, as soon as fertilization happens, you're actually seeing the soul. The soul enter the, the egg. Yeah. You talk about life starting at conception, bam. Yeah. Wow. Light is released. And what did Jesus, or what, what did Jesus say in John? I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What? Who? How? Just like Brian was talking about these stones uh, two weeks ago, a week ago. The light of life, as soon as conception happens, boom, a flash of light. The zinc firework. Zinc firework. So, what does that do with my message? Absolutely nothing. I just thought it was super cool because Brian did that last week. Are you done? Are you done with it? You want me? Yeah, 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 you can shut it down. Wait, could you mention uh, Ezekiel? Ezekiel. What, 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 what we found about the stones. Yeah, yeah, I'll head up to the end, yeah. So, what are we going to talk about today? So, really, it's a, already a little bit of a synopsis. Um, Romans 10 9. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised him in the from the dead. Bella, what will happen? You will be saved. You will be saved. That's a good memory. She's got a memory on today. <laughs> Now, after that, you know what we need to talk about? Sin. It's way overcomplicated. Everybody talks about, good morning, Sharon. How are you? Thanks for bringing your doggy. Um, everybody talks about the different degrees of sin. And it's super easy for us as Christians, and you know, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Are we judging? Are we confessing? Are we having conversation about sin? It's like this. It's like this visceral reaction that everybody gets real quick. I say sin is like, 
as Christians, we're supposed to, 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 to flee from it. But what is it? Thank you, Michaela. Way overcomplicated. It's super easy because God gives us a reference, right? God gives us a reference, and the reference is the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are basically a rough outline. Does that mean that those are the only sins? No. I'm going to simplify it very easily. Sin is anything that separates you from God. Sin is anything, anything that separates you from God. It could be murder. It could be coveting. It could be uh, dishonoring your mom and dad. There's ten of them. There's ten commandments. And we can go through line item by line item what they are. That's not what all they are. And here's where the trouble comes in. Here's where the, the concerning thing is. If that's not all of them, what are they? It's super easy to define. And we shouldn't overcomplicate it. Do I think more about my wife than I do about God? If the answer is yes, sin. Do I think more about making sure my kids have enough, i.e. finances, or i.e. vacations, or i.e. guitars, or whatever it is? If I think more about that, it's separating me from God. And the conversation I had with Izzy this week was, why are we stressing? What are we stressing about? The, the, the kind of cool thing in my mind is there's only so much bad that can happen. <laughs> if we're really going to be honest, there's only so much garbage that we can go through. We're all human beings on earth that is full of things that are going to separate us from God if we let them. That's the powerful part of it. If we let them separate us from God, guess what? They will. Similar to what Dad's talking about in relationships this morning, there are many things in this earth that we let separate our relationships, that, let, that we let distract us from not only each other, but ultimately what's important from God. Do not let anything on this earth separate a relationship by distracting you particularly from God. Because that's how the enemy wins. When Jesus was tempted in the, in the desert, the first thing he was tempted with was what? A piece of bread. Because that was what, the way that the enemy said, I'm going to distract him. He just went 40 days and 40 nights. I'm going to make it insignificant. Here, Jesus, here's a piece of bread. It wasn't Hey, Jesus, let's go kill somebody. Hey, Jesus, let's go covet something. Hey, let's uh, 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 dishonor your mom and dad by X, Y, or Z. It was, here's a piece of bread. Dan, this morning, was talking about relationships in the family. Are we really going to let what we have for lunch this afternoon distract us from the relationship that we have? Are we going to let tithing? Are we going to let... Sprinkle versus immersion baptism separate a church? Now, it's easy right now for us to say, no, of course not. The, the lasagna, Cheryl makes awesome lasagna. It's delicious. It's not. But is it unleavened bread? That's what the significance of Jesus is. That's, what signif that's what's significant about Jesus' coming. And I can prove it to you. Paul writes to the Romans. Romans 7, 4, through 6. Romans 7, 4 through 6. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, Back up. What is sin? Don't overcomplicate it. When we were controlled by things that distracted us from God, the sinful passions aroused by the law 
we're at work in the body, in, in our bodies, so that we bore fruit for death. Wow. What a powerful statement. And how, how? These, now, again, me and you, I'm, I guarantee we could nerd out, and I can tell you how I think that our ancestors were drastically more wise, drastically more knowledge-bearing than we are today. And there's some, there's some uh, genetic um, literature that would confirm what I'm telling you. Again, zinc fireworks is enough for today, okay? <laughs> but there is literature out there talking about how our ancestors and mutations and genetic mutations are negative more than positive. It's like one out of a million. But how in the world does a man write something as profound as <clears throat> to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God? For when we were controlled by our sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. Sin equals death. And guess what we just said sin was? A departure from God, a distraction from God. You distract yourself further and further away from God, guess what you end up with? Death. The culmination of sin. That visceral feeling that we get. Somebody told me just this recently. Hell is a horrible place. And in the Bible it talks about fire and brimstone and sulfur and a gnashing of teeth. Do you know what's worse? It's an absence of God. When people choose not to follow Christ, when people choose not to follow Him, they say, I'm going to be so distracted and equal death and absent from God. That's what hell is. An ultimate distraction that says, no. Horrible. Dreadful. Evil. Gnashing of teeth, burning, red, dark. But now, by dying, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Right there, God is saying, enough with the distractions, enough with sin. You can't do the, the, the free will offerings. You can't do the, the burn offerings. You're done. I'm sick of it. Here's my son. Do away with those distractions. Do away with that evil. Do away with the absence of God and take a part of him. An absence of sin. A death to sin equals zinc fire. Light. Light. A new birth. Away with the distractions of sin. Now, this is super important, okay? I'm going to hit home here. And again, I, I make an excuse. I'm tired. My wife will, will contest to this. Some people at work will contest to this. They say, what's wrong? I'm like, I'm just tired. I got a little emotional. We have mementos from family. And I'm looking at Dan because he is... He's the ultimate keepsaker. He will take a piece of cedar wood and make it into an unbelievable spear. He'll take a piece of this old rusty file and make it into this, this beautiful, shiny, he puts wood and brass. And I, I'm trying to get him to make a, a certain, I want a sword. I'm, you know, Billy's got an axe. I, you know. Those mementos from our family. We have letters, right? Or we wish we had letters from grandpas and grandmas and, and, and our, our moms. Dan holds on to a check that his mom wrote because it's got her signature on it. I mean, does that give you goosebumps or what? I'm going to hit home now, okay? Hang on. Do you know what this is? God's Word. That's God's Word. And I don't need a raise of hands, but how many of us are really diving into it? We have, a, we have a letter from a loved one that died less than a generation ago. And we look at it as a memento. We look at it with, with reverence. What about this? How many of us are diving into God's word 
and saying, God, this is, this is a part of me. This is here to, to give us a gift of love and, of, and, and passion. You know, you want to talk about getting away from those distractions of sin? Open this up, man. Dad talks about uh, how to raise a family. Guess where he got it? Dad talks about how to get finances. Guess where he got it? We talk about how to, to discipline one another. We talk about how to, to, to present somebody information about COVID. Guess where we can get it? The knowledge of our world, the knowledge of who we are, everything that you want to know about life, kids, is right there. Amen. From, this is going to be a little romantic, okay? This fall, me and Megan, I've always told her from the beginning of our relationship that um, I can't wait till we have spent more time together than we have apart. A little romantic thing I do for her, whatever. Okay? And this fall is when we hit it. We were walking last weekend, it was my birthday, and we were walking up here and kind of reminiscing. You know, when you hit a birthday, especially as you get older, you kind of reminisce a little bit. And uh, I kind of, you know, we were kind of chatting about that. And I said to her, Megan, you know what's wild to think is how quickly 18 years has gone by. Just a, just a, a flash. Just, just, it's unreal how, how I, I'm now the age that I remember my parents. This is so weird. Like our kids, it's like 18 and Izzy and Abby and the college and wow. But you know what? It's not even, this is the start of eternity. It's the start of eternity. Unreal. And so when I'm reading this, I'm thinking to myself, wow, I need to read my Bible. I need, to, I need to open this up more. I need to, to make sure that I'm reminiscing about relationships and holding on to that signature on a check. And if we really think about sin, and we really think about Jesus and who we're supposed to emulate, somebody asked him, Lord, what, what commandments are the greatest? How, how should we act? How should we be? Who, you know, you give us the Ten Commandments, and you know, obviously the Jews were, were, were kind of really fascinated with, and, and really holding sacred those Ten Commandments. W which ones are important? Which ones should we hold? Is there a hierarchy? And Jesus said there were two. Two of the greatest commandments. And I'm sure a majority of us know what they are. Um, Matthew 22 is what I have marked, so I... You know, go ahead and assume. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. What did I say? Matthew 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and the Pharisees, got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, obviously as Christians, we're Christ followers, right? And so what should we do? We should hold on to what Christ says. The two greatest commandments are... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. So in the first thing in my primitive brain, what I say is, what is love? I cannot tell you how many teenagers I see on a weekly basis. And the first thing I say to them is, is what's his name? And they do that. What do you mean? <laughs> or if it's a if it's a, a, a guy say what's her name? <laughs> what do you mean? You know what I mean. You dog, you, you dog. Should never trust anything that smells that good. You know what I mean? <laughs> never trust anything that smells that good. And they say, Well, I'm in love. And my answer to them is, is are you a Christian? And we go down this road of, yeah, I'm a Christian. What does Christian mean? And we kind of define it. Again, I want them to, to be emboldened with who they are. 
If you're going to be a Christian, say it with your chest, man. Your dad will confess this to anybody. Say it with your chest. I'm not going to bend a knee. I'm, I'm proud to be a Christian. We, we touched on it a little bit just a, a few minutes ago. There's nothing wrong with it. Our culture has is, is like condemned us for some reason for having a conviction about being good people. Stop. I'm a Christian. I believe in my soul. I believe in my heart. I will confess it to anyone who asks me, and even those who don't, that Jesus Christ is Lord, number one. And I believe in my heart, in my soul, in my being, who I am, that he raised from the dead. Period. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. Say it with your chest. Okay? Then we talk about, with these kids, what is love? <sighs> How do you define love? Everybody's got this little, this feeling of, she smells good, man. She smells good. Or, man, he's so handsome. He's got chest hair and he's getting good <laughs> muscles and he's, he defends me and all this other stuff, right? Well, what is love? I, I heard a lot of physical stuff, but what is, what is love? Tell me about it. And everybody kind of hems and haws. Eh, I don't really know. Well, I'll tell you, because I do know. You know why? Because this book tells me. 1 John 4.16 we're jumping all over the place. 1 John 4.16. 1 John 4.16. And Rose, I should have gave you the numbers. I told She told me, she warned me on my Tuesday. Give me the things so I can put them up here. 1 John 4.16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for all of us. Period. God is love. Okay, Blake. God is love. Okay, that seems like a little bit of a circular definition. <laughs> you didn't really tell me what love is, right? We've all been to weddings, right? The majority of us kids, you've all been to a wedding, right? 1 Corinthians 13. If God is love, 1 Corinthians 13, a letter to the Corinthians, Paul talks about love. And everybody's going to recognize this because this is the most, you know, those popular the uh, cliches at weddings. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's my definition of love. Now, when we start to extrapolate that, if you go back, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who shall ever believe in him will have eternal life. God is love and he never fails. Life is super easy. Super easy. Do not be distracted from God. That's what sin is. A distraction. And understand the love that he gave us is right in front of you. A salvation of Jesus Christ. And all that distraction, all that sin is covered with one human being. Jesus Christ. Life is that simple. And you know what you get to do for the rest of eternity? Is it enjoy with me? Because at the end of the day, we can easily, the enemy is going to be very clever in ways to distract us. Ways to separate us from God. Ways to separate us from his love. But he tells us, patient, God is kind, 
He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. He does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects. He always trusts. He always hopes. He always perseveres, and he never fails. As long as we don't get distracted, we can be a part of that. But as soon as we are distracted by our sin, something as simple as is our wives, something as simple as is being Catholic, not Christian, something as simple as is I need to go to a Baptist church instead of a Presbyterian church, something as simple as driving too fast. You know, we get frustrated on our ways to work. You know what's crazy to think about? You know how long we've had hot water showers? I mean, there's people in this room that understand hot water heaters came out in like the 1940s and 50s. For the generations before that, nobody took a hot shower. And we get aggravated about that. We'll be driving to work, some of us too fast, <laughs> saying, hey, I'm frustrated because this person's going five miles an hour slower than I want to go. Seriously, distracting us from God, did a hundred years ago, guess what? A majority of people didn't leave five miles from where they were born in the house that they were born in. How easy the enemy distracts us from God's love. I'm going to leave you with this. Again, because I'm a little bit tired. I'm getting... A little bit aggravated with the world. At the end of the day, I, 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 I keep on hearing how God is, is like this, this super power being that directs people into to evil de desires and passions. I mean, the Old Testament is full of, of hatred for your fellow human being and death and, and, and poverty and, and destruction. We forget that we have a free will. We are not just a collection of chemical synapses in our brain that form a thought. We have a soul. We have a will that we get to make decisions. In history, we are reminded of very evil people. And very good people. And at the end of the day, we all have a choice. It's called free will. And we get to choose what will distract us. If it's going to be finances, if it's going to be the law, the Ten Commandments, if it's going to be COVID, if it's going to be wearing a mask, if it's going to be our wives, if it's going to be our kids, there are many things in this world that the enemy will, will use in order to distract you from God, which is sin. But we have a free will to say, stop. God's love supersedes these distractions. God's passion and his desire for you is much greater than those distractions that the enemy can put in front of us. Amen. Use your free will that God gave you. You are not an angel. You are not an, what are they called, NPCs or whatever. The, you're not a drone. You are a human being with a free will. Use that free will to turn towards Christ. And you will be blessed. I know it for a fact. Dear Lord, I thank you for the individuals in this, this room. I thank you for the love that they have for you, the passion that they have for you, the desire to know you more. I pray that we will stop the distractions of this world and truly lean on one another, knowing that we are going to be easily distracted, but not allowing that piece of bread to separate us from you. I thank you for the blessings that you've put in my life. And it starts in this room, Lord. 
You say, wherever two shall gather, you will be there. And I know that you are here. I feel your presence. I feel your, your spirit. And I thank you for protecting us. Please help us to be reminded. And please use each one of us to remind each other of who you are. What love truly is. And not be distracted by the evil and the, the, the lack of, of God in our culture, Lord. I pray for the leaders of our culture. I pray for the individuals in this room that are leaders. And I pray that you will give us a voice to support one another and to encourage one another as a family to do your will. We love you so very much. And I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' beautiful, powerful, and wonderful name I pray. Amen. I hope you enjoyed that message. It was a great one. Join us next Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. God bless.